Hi guys, uh, sorry for late this, for the delay. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Michal, and I'll be speaking about type safe techniques for a better sleep at night. Actually, this happens to be kind of a complimentary talk to what Magda did already. Uh, but before we go into the details, few words about myself. Uh, I'm a software engineer. I do some OSS work. I, I write a blog. I'm present on Mastodon if you want to find me. And I work for Ocado Technology, uh, which is all those fancy bots that are riding, uh, riding right there. Uh, we support warehouses. So imagine like a grocery store sized of, I don't know, Biedronka, like your, your small local uh, grocery store. It's full of those bots and we provide backend services. We write them in Scala. And the key point for today is that they have to work 24 seven. If you want to learn more, we have uh, the place near the coffee booth. You can ask some more questions, but uh, we have to support them 24 seven. This is the key. And the, the problem with doing 24-7 support is that sometimes there are system failures, right? Nobody likes them. And uh, there are different kinds of errors. You can have those that you don't really have influence over because you have the network issues or something like that. But there are also those that happen because you have made a mistake when writing your code. And in this presentation, I want to start with a life cycle of an error. So you can basically have one uh, situation when there is a runtime error. So let me tell you a story. Imagine you're having a great sleep at night, but suddenly your phone rings, and it is not your favorite contact. It's pager duty or something else, and uh, you know you're not gonna sleep well. Uh, you don't be. You won't be well rested, right? So uh, you try to figure out figure out what's happening. Uh, there is the pressure because someone relies on the system. This is the middle of the night, so you barely remember what your name is and regardless to say to how the system works. But maybe by the sunrise you manage to fix things up. But not all of us have the uh, possibility to you know, take, some, take a nap during the day. So this is how you looked the whole next day. Uh, it wasn't a great story, <laughs> but let's, uh, let's have a different perspective. So we had the runtime, now let's think of compile time. Another story. It begins with your regular day. <laughs> you had the good sleep. So you're doing your work in your office or at your home office. Then suddenly a compiler appears. And no surprise, you have to sort it out. It's, it may be even more complex than the thing you had at night because the compile errors are not very uh, friendly sometimes. But then you have your friends because this is the middle of the day, it's not the night. So someone can help you with that. And then in a matter of time, you sort it out. There is no pressure because the code haven't left your computer yet, right? And then you get the best sleep at night. So yeah, the benefit is obvious, right? So end of the story, wrapping up. Runtime errors, I think they are more difficult than the compile one because they happen when the app is running because someone relies on that. This can have significant consequences. Uh, yeah, and the compile time, well, it only happens on your computer and the problematic code never leaves your machine. So I guess this is something we would like to aim for. I would state that we prefer compile time errors over the runtime ones. So is there a way to move from runtime to compile time, at least in some cases? Well, I could say no and get out of the stage. But yes, there is a way. And we can do this with Scala. And there are some techniques that might uh, help you with that. So let's start simple. Say we are tasked with designing an application. QA walks into the bar, and we are the ones to design the API for the B request. Remember that from the last night, right? Uh, so the easiest way, the laziest way, would be to model the beer order as a string. Not the smartest one, but we are after the after party. Uh, there are plenty of things that can go wrong, right? You can get, like, literally strings. Uh, we don't like them. So let's try something else. Let's try with double. We've eliminated some of the data, right? But it's still not perfect. In the standard library, we also have int. It's better. At this stage, you can see that I've removed null because let's assume we do idiomatic scala at least. But still, this is the best we can do with the standard library, right? But we still have the zero minus three, so we would have to like write a test that the system somewhere downstream can handle these cases, right? But we also have refined types, and this is what uh, Magda mentioned, and I will go a little bit deeper into that in a second. 
So with refined types, you aim to reflect your uh, requirements onto the type system. And in this very simple example, we just say that we want to have a positive int, and otherwise the code will not compile. So refinement types uh, are a thing that allow you to put additional constraint on the existing types. So think of a string that also has to be a valid UUID, for example. And uh, the example below with the one, two, three, it won't compile, actually. You, we've seen the post int. You can also put things like even or odd. Uh, I, by the way, use the refined library like uh, this one, but Scala has a few of them. I just selected that because this is the thing I'm most familiar with. Still, uh, regarding the refinement types, you can create your own. For example, you can like parse strings against uh, regex or something. You can also combine them. So you can think of, I only want to have like integers that are positive and even, for example. So this is something that Refine uh, provides you with. And I encourage you to like visit the link, see the examples. There are plenty of those. So yeah, moving on. The first example wasn't really like real world, but we had to warm up with something. So let's move on. Imagine we are modeling a domain for like a store where someone can place an order, right? So an order is basically a list of like lines, each representing a product that has a name and quantity. So there are some constraints. Say the name cannot be empty. It is some identifier, what I don't know. And the quantity obviously must be a positive hint. So we've seen that already. Uh, and with this like standard library thing, we can uh, model the right states of the system. But we also can model what is unexpected, right? So this is something that the compiler will not help us with that. And imagine it happens uh, during the night that the system got this Wrong, wrong kind of stuff, and well, it accepted it because it matched the types, right? So let's think for a while that we don't have refined types and see how we would implement like a logic that would deal with those. So we have like a safe apply or any other like smart constructor that would take care of those, uh, of those situations where the uh, values are not expected. We could throw like an exception or I don't know, return an option, whatever we would eliminate the invalid inputs. But it comes with the drawbacks, because the compiler can't really help us with that. We just have to use the API in the right way. Uh, we wrote some code, quite a bit, uh, so we need to write tests for that as well. And it doesn't really place nicely on the edges of the system when you need to parse some data on the input, think like JSON parsing, XML, whatever. So we, we, will, look, we will be looking for something better. So let's apply the refined types. And this is the old code you need to, you need to write. So basically, few imports. And uh, yeah, using the right types that ex like match our uh, domain knowledge and, and uh, requirements. So the line below that represents the invalid state will not compile. So there are clearly some advantages. We have compile time checks and the support from the compiler. The code is cleaner, I guess, uh, and some and it's self-documenting, some would argue. Uh, you have to write less tests because you wrote less code. And then this specific library, Refines, it comes with uh, like interoperability with, different, with other different libraries. Think Circe, PureConfig, Duby, so whatever edges you might have when you uh, like process the data uh, and you need to like convert from, uh, from raw strings. It also comes with some drawbacks. So we ha definitely have the increased compilation time because compiler has more work to do, right? And you still so have some additional imports and something I forgot to put on the slide, but uh, if you're doing the, like a system that has to be very performant, refined types also go with some runtime overhead. So you have to take that in consideration as well. But yeah, I think it's, it's worth it. And let's take this example a step further. So we have modeled the domain somewhat, and we know that uh, it's, it's neat and nice. So let's build a very trivial API. It will have one endpoint, HTTP endpoint, that will take a JSON on the input and say whether the input, whether the JSON provided is a valid order. All right? So uh, back to the domain. We have seen the order line. Now what makes an order is a non-empty list of order lines and a UID. So just like an order ID, right? 
Uh, one thing to note is that non-empty list is actually not something from refined library, but from cats. But it doesn't matter. Uh, it will play well. W this is just like the right tool for the job. We don't want like empty lines because order with no lines makes no sense. So this is why it's here. We have the domain modeled. So the next thing, since we want to parse the JSON, is to add codex. Uh, I know that seasoned Scala developers know exactly what happens here. Uh, but if you're new to Scala or, or just learning, so codec is a thing that allows you to convert your data types both ways. So given a string, you can produce uh, the data type you have, assuming it is like uh, formatted properly, has uh, matches the, the requirements, and also can encode. So if you have the structure in your memory, then you can produce a string. And uh, derive codec, this is kind of magic that uh, inspects the type and uh, guesses the behavior because there is like only one correct way to encode and decode the data type. This is something that comes from Circe and like it comes out of the box with the with the macros. Uh, so so we have the data type, we have the codecs. The next thing is to model the endpoint. For that, I'm going to use Tapir. And again, I thought that someone will explain Tapir by this moment at Scalar. <laughs> But uh, who is familiar with Tapir? Raise your hands, please. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to explain it. Uh, just quickly, what we're going to make. So we need one endpoint, which is validate. It is a public endpoint. It takes an order and returns nothing interesting, because we only need to do like 200 and 400 at the output. So this endpoint takes a POST request. It is available on some validate path. And this is the very important line. So we expect the endpoint to be invoked only when presented with a valid JSON representation of the order, right? And there is the output, but it's not interesting. So at this point, when we have the endpoint defined, uh, what is the next thing you need to do in Tapir to make this work? Like binding the logic, right? So you have the endpoint, then you need some sort of a router. So let's get, to, uh, get into it. On the bottom, you can see we invoke the endpoint and provide some logic to the server via the server logic invocation. So what would be the logic? Well, it's nothing. Simply because uh, if you provide like an invalid order, Circe will not decode it, and then Tapio will not uh, recognize this call as a valid invocation of the endpoint. So only thanks to the correct domain modeling and expressing, expressing our like, requirements in the right way within the type system, we get also the logic for free. And this is something interesting that happens here. Of course, this is very like a, a fake example. You don't do this kind of order validation. But in some specific cases, you just don't have to write the production code thanks to the value encoding. So the boring stuff is here the binding of the endpoints, so we have the router, then we create the server, and then we run the server forever, just to prove that it works. We could invoke the endpoint with like the valid data structure, so we have the order ID, which is like the valid UID. We have the lines, which are not empty strictly because there is one line, and everything matches. We have 200 response OK, and uh, yeah, and that works. For the error cases, it also works. You can see the log below that the predicate failed because we've simply provided the negative quantity. And also, if you provided an empty list of lines, it will also fail. So, well, it seems that we have done the job without writing the business code. Makes sense. So key takeaways from this part, uh, business requirements can sometimes be encoded in your data types, right? Just provided that you use refinement types and like express your uh, your intentions clearly, data validation then comes for free on the edges, especially when something comes from your end user. And as I said, less code means less tests and probably less bugs. Hopefully, if you want to see the full example, feel free to scan the QR code. If it doesn't scan well, just reach me out and I will share the link somehow. Uh, yeah, uh, hopefully it was uh, it was helpful. And uh, since we still have some, some time, uh, we covered only HTTP, right? Uh, but there are other ways you, your system can take inputs from the user 
And in this uh, like a bonus section, I want to focus on consuming messages. So how about message processing? There are different ways to process messages, but what I want to show specifically today is something that we developed at Ocado, and it's open source. It's not very yet popular, but maybe you want to give it a try. So this is pass for s a library that we use for working with like abstracting uh, message processing. So think of a like Tapir, but for messages. So you have the abstraction for sender and for the consumer, and somewhere else you have the real implementation of your like SNS, SQS, ActiveMQ or something. So if you want to send messages from your code, uh, basically this is the only thing you should need, right? So you should only like have the message of the type you want, put it somewhere and produce f of unit and something else should take care of actually sending it somewhere. And this should be your only dependency in your business logic, right? And uh, when consuming messages, this is a slightly more complex, but let's focus on the first line there. So if you want to consume the message, the, all you th actually want to do is take a message and produce some side effect from that, right? So, I don't know, print it, log it, save it to database somewhere. So we decided to have like two approaches. One is when you're working with like a single effect, uh, it is just the, the simple approach, but in some cases, you might want to have a separate effect for IO and then separate for DB, like IO and connection IO with DB or something else. And you only want to like commit the transaction, commit the message if you were able to save it to the database. So in this case, the T is converted to the DB action, but this is like a bit more advanced. The, the first one is completely all right for our example. So considering we have the order that we already validated, say we want to send it somewhere, whatever, Kinesis, whatever, uh, how would we do that? So. Uh, Analogously to Tapir, at some point in your main code, you would uh, create the server. I used Blaze server in the previous example. So here you need to create like a connector to connect to the uh, data target in this case to SNS. And then assuming you have this connector, you hide it behind the broker. So the broker is your level of abstraction that provides you with the sender and the consumer. And in this specific case, we ask the broker to give the sender, then we say, all the messages I'm going to send to this specific destination will be orders. So I want you, the broker, to encode them properly to strings prior to sending them. And the only thing that we do in the business logic actually is just like sender send one or sender send from streams, stuff like that, and produce the messages to some queue. And we're done. So I guess this is like a good uh, abstraction level. But the more important thing considering this, uh, the topic of this talk is consuming messages, right? Because we want to make sure that the data, considering we, pr we like provided the right domain model, will not reach uh, us without the validation. So in this case, we have this message processor, which is a thing like another abstraction. We say that we want to process messages, so the first line. Then we say that we want to use the, uh, the IO uh, as the effect. The third line says effectful. It means that we only want to invoke effect in the I.O. If we were to do something like transactional, connection I.O., then it would be like transaction and provided the, the second higher order uh, type. Then we provide the broker because it knows where to connect. And the last line is the more impor most important regarding the validation because we say the consumer needs to take care of the deserialization, right? So we only want to accept the messages that are the correct orders. And thanks to Circe, the derivation, stuff, stuff below that we showed on the previous slide, uh, our business logic will actually only process messages that are of the right order type. So if someone sends something that is malformed, that does not match our requirements, we will not accept such message. It will land somewhere on DLQ. And uh, yeah, we only work in the business logic with the higher level types stuff like that. Uh, yeah, if you want to play with it, there is a link. Uh, also, if it's not very readable, just reach out to me and, uh, and I'll be happy to, to tell you more about that. Yeah, either read or just ask. Thank you for your patience and for your attention. <laughs> Thank you.
Yes. If we have some time, I guess we can take some questions. Yeah, and definitely. Then, yeah. Any question is welcome. If you're too shy, we are at the coffee place, so. <laughs> I see a question up there. Um, Raise your hand one more time, yeah. Uh, thanks, nice presentation. And nice it came after the opaque type <laughs> one. So uh, the natural question is, uh, do you see the future of uh, refined types uh, after introduction of opaque types in, in Scala 3? And maybe for now, uh, for which use case would you prefer opaque types or, uh, or refined types? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was not intended. I mean, we didn't arrange that. So yeah, congrats to the organizers for having this feeling to that. And regarding the opaque types, I think they, uh, what we proved together is that they can play along each other. Because with opaque types, you want to, you want to hide some implementation details in your library. You can have like a very high level name for the, for the type, for example, and then the validation itself is only done by the refined type. Because with the opaque types, you also have to do some of the logic. And perhaps you can infer some of these functionalities, especially for the very primitive types, like posint and stuff like that, uh, on, the, on the refined level. So I think they play well together. Anyone else? Uh, I have one more question about uh, this Pass4S library. And like, how does it work when for example, a message cannot be uh, deserialized, and you have a queue like SQS, uh, what happens then? Because it, it could get stuck, right? Yeah, so we try to process such message with Pass4S, and then if we cannot decode it, we will just throw it away to the DLQ. And yeah, re reasonably, reasonable approach is to try to like process it a couple times, because you you really don't distinguish if it was because the serialization or some IO error, but if you happen to be, if it happens to be problematic to pro process it like a few times, then it just lands on the DLQ and someone has to take care of that, which I guess makes sense because someone is sending the wrong type of messages, right? Um, hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, question regarding pass 4 s two. Does it try to abstract away uh, queue-specific de details for instance, when you have RabbitMQ, you potentially should handle queue exchanges and so on. We, with Kafka, you have fun with offset manage, management, for, for instance, and it is kind of hard to provide universal interface for, for that. So is it intended to do that or so? For user, how I should consider it? Yeah, so uh, the question is if it does anything like queue specific. So it would be, it would be good to like say a few words how it originated. We had like to migrate from ActiveMQ to SNS and SQS, and we wanted to those two to play along for a while. So we provided two implementations, uh, uh, like below this interface, for ActiveMQ and for SNS SQS. We didn't play with like RabbitMQ Kafka. I guess to some extent it would be possible, but uh, the idea is to abstract away the the simple part first. But yeah, uh, it's very simple to, to you know, provide your own connector implementations and see when it stops to play well, I think. Because the, the library is pretty new, so yeah, we haven't had a chance to play around multiple implementations. Although it would be nice to see it, so thanks for the question. <laughs>